Okay. Um, had one uh, person comment, say, hey, your sound's not working because the pause was so long. <laughs> and then came back and said, oh, never mind. Anyway, um, okay. This, this is... This was really good for me to kind of sort through my head. Um, okay, so in the last video, I I talked about the half hour of silence. I kind of wish I wouldn't have, because I really don't think we know much about the half hour of silence. But what we do know, what we do know is that the 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 declaration that we studied last week the the two declarations but particularly the one on the priesthood is really really significant in my opinion so if we go should have been a little more prepared here i had my last uh is um uh one for israel class this morning and it was those that were taking credit uh, or taking the class for credit, did their presentations. It was really good. It was really good. Uh, one did his presentation. He's a songwriter and did it in the form of a song. It was it was amazing. So I, I might get into that in another video um, because we got hammered with some good snow and I, I've been out shoveling. And so anyway, okay. So... Um, Matthew 24 is is somewhat our go-to for uh, uh, the second coming of Christ. It's, it's his words as, re, as recorded. Um, verse 14, Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Okay, so that... That's pretty cool. Um, and there's other, other um, you know, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and all that kind of stuff, too, that we could go to. But, but I think that's significant. And it ties directly into declaration number two. Um, now, during the time of the prophet Joseph, I think there's at least one, but maybe other, uh, recorded uh, ordinations to the priesthood of those of African American or descent, okay, or African descent. Um, it's interesting in the proclamation. It doesn't. It doesn't say anything about race. It just says every worthy uh, male, right? Um, if we go to that, um, ba -ba -ba -ba. <laughs> so we go to that declaration. Um, he, uh, I'm, I'm down at the third paragraph of the, of the, of the letter that's signed by the first presidency. He has heard our prayers and by revelation has confirmed that the long promised day has come when every faithful worthy man in the church may receive the holy priesthood with power to exercise its divine authority and to joy and enjoy with his loved ones, every blessing that flows therefrom. And, and it, it, it goes through, um, we declare with soberness that the Lord has now made known his will for the blessing. This is powerful. And I mentioned that this was very significant in the wording, very significant in, in, uh, not just bearing a testimony of God, but saying that God revealed this to us. Okay. Now for me, uh, to to expand that now that ties directly into Matthew twenty four fourteen, because up until then, with a few exceptions under Joseph Smith, um, from Brigham Young to President Kimball, that time period, um, the gospel wasn't preached in all the world as a witness. The whole African continent was basically ignored. And okay, I went to. Uh, Nova Scotia. And I was in a, I can't remember the name of the town, um, but in our area, uh, just outside of Halifax, there was a community of all uh, black African American, and their origin was the Underground Railroad. Um, 
uh, that got them from the United States slavery and got them up to Canada where there wasn't. So it's pretty cool. And we were specifically told, do not proselyte um, among them. And guess what? <laughs> Hard to believe. I, I just felt compelled uh, with my companion and uh, said, you know, these people, we, we can go and, and at least um, just share our testimonies and place some copies of the Book of Mormon. And it was, it was a neat experience. And then it was maybe a year after that, that, that this, this declaration number two came, came forward. So I jumped the gun a little bit. Sorry, President Baker. Uh, God, God rest your soul. Um, I jumped the gun a little bit. Now we could, we could talk about the gospel to someone of African descent if they, if they, um, approached us, but we, we couldn't actively go out that we were told not to. Um, so really n n not every nation, kindred, tongue, and people were, were at the restoration and, and subsequent years with, with Brigham Young on. And I'm not going to get into why I don't think we know um, and so I, I don't think it does any good to speculate with that because it could lead you down, you know, forbidden paths. We don't want that. But what we do know is that in 1978, that all changed. Now, when there's an announcement, or in this case, a declaration, um, is, it, is it just like that accomplished? No, it's not. It takes some time. And now it's been 43 years or so since that time. So this got me thinking. Um, I know I've been studying a lot in the Old Testament and I can't wait to, to, to do that this coming year. And, 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 you know, the bulk of the Book of Mormon is, is in the Old Testament type time period. So, and it originates in Jerusalem with Lehi. Um, oh, I wish we had his writings. Uh, I'm really looking forward to getting that someday. But with Lehi prophesying the same time as the prophet Jeremiah, I think that tie-in isn't just by chance. Just by chance. So I did a little research on this um, as, as the thoughts started churning. So how far in advance was Jeremiah and other prophets uh, warning the people of Jerusalem that they were going to end up the same as their northern brethren ended up with, with the Assyrians attacking them a hundred plus years before, and, and it's going to happen. Now, I think too often we think that as soon as Lehi and his family left, um, that King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came and, and took over. But it was actually, what, about 13, 14 years later uh, that that prophecy was fulfilled. And then if you take the prophet Jeremiah, a lot of historians, and I've, I've got to look at this, believe that he started prophesying under King Josiah's reign uh, around 626 BC. So if you take if you take the span of 626 uh, to um, 586, right? Is that right? BC, because that's when that's when the Babylonians actually uh, conquered Jerusalem and took them captive and laid waste to the temple. Uh, it's about forty years. It's about forty years. So the warnings for the day of destruction for Jerusalem started approximately forty years with the prior to. 
concerning the prophet Jeremiah. And, and if you notice, Isaiah doesn't spend a ton of time on that. He calls the people to repentance, obviously, but his, his prophecies of the Messiah, both um, of his birth and, and then the latter days, his second coming, are amazing. Um, and that's what he focuses more on. And Jeremiah focuses more on, you know, destruction. He, he, he covers it all, but, but he really pounds the destruction, the, 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 the prophetic destruction of Jerusalem. And then that ties in Lehi for us, okay? So, because all, all these prophecies are years in advance of, of the prophecy being fulfilled. So I got thinking, well, maybe because of the tie-in with the Book of Mormon and Lehi, maybe we ought to look at those dates and compare them to our situation today. So if you go back 40, 41 years, that gets, puts us to 1980. And who was the prophet in 1980? President Kimball. The announcement had just come forward. I think that's significant because this is really when the gospel is going to go throughout the world. The, God, the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, because there's a whole continent, the African continent, that's being ignored um, for the most part. Okay, And I know you'll find some exceptions and things like that. Um, I'm talking about overall. Uh, and so now that every worthy male... And they, and I think we have to include the female because they weren't allowed in the temple either. So that's an interesting thing there. That gets into to a whole. So so anyway, a whole group of people, let's say, were now uh, open to preach to to enjoy all the blessings of the restoration. And it's, you know, about thereabouts. Now, when do we start getting warnings about the apostasy in the church, secret combinations, uh, one world government, the very next prophet, President Benson, very specific about it. And I think he, when we talk about prophets, I, I think we sometimes it's it's good for us to go back when they were apostles as well, because it's their apostleship is leading up and they're giving us hints as to the direction that we're going to be going. Uh, President Nelson is a perfect example of that. Um, I've mentioned this before, but when we were in the MTC to, to preside over our mission, mission president seminar, they call it back then. I think, I don't know what they call it now, but. Um, leadership, I don't know what it is. But anyway, President Nelson then was the, the, pro, uh, the, the member of the, of the 12 that was over missionary work like, like Elder Uchtdorf is now. And he said, our, our, in, in that seminar, he said our main objective uh, in the church is to um, um, gather scattered Israel and once they're gathered, see that they're sealed in the temple, uh, sealed to God in the temple is how I like to say it, and then prepare ourselves and others for the second coming of the Savior. So this is very, uh, remembering that we go to now, and it's it's the same kind of message, right? So I think, I think it, it's good for us to look at the whole um, aspect of, of, of both President Kimball and President Benson, from from apostleship to president of the church and prophet Seer and Revelator. So just as Jeremiah and Lehi's prophecy concerning um, the destruction of Jerusalem because of their wickedness, I think we could go back about the same time period of when Jeremiah started this prophesying, prophesying um, about the destruction of Jerusalem, we could do the same thing and go back from this day for, backward about the same time. And, and this is right where we get. We get towards the end of President Kimball with that wonderful announcement and then the beginning of 
President Benson. And so really what they're saying, what they said then is for us today. I'll give you a for instance. So this week we're, we're studying the proclamation, the family, a proclamation to the world. Now at the time, some of you that might look like this, <laughs> um, we remember when that proclamation came out and we're like, what's so marriage between a man and a woman? Hello. You know, of course it, 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 it was like, this is so obvious. What's the big deal. And now we look at it today and go, oh, this, this proclamation was for us today to remind us, wake up, this is it. This is how we're supposed to be, not how the world perceives things and, and, and us getting sucked into Babylon. Now, I really think that we need to focus on the words of President Benson for what we need today. What President Nelson is saying, a lot of it we're going, well, yeah, sure, okay. And, and it will get us into the future. Now, look, obviously, things that Jeremiah said and things that President Benson said, there's some things that pertain to right then and there. But they're overall, um, you know, how every prophet seems to have a theme or, or something that drives them. You know, President Monson was lifting the, the hands that hang down and visiting, the, and not just visiting, but taking care of the poor and the needy. And, and, and that was President Benson was the Book of Mormon, warnings, you know, kind of thing. President uh, uh, Hinckley, to me, seemed to be the, the um, force of, of not only getting the name of the church out into the public more, um, but, but and, and he wasn't afraid of the word Mormon, um, you know, but he used it. But um, so, so more of the media approach. And then, of course, temple, temple worship and temple building throughout the world. And then that, you know, and, and we could go back, back. Um, it's a little harder to identify the further we go back because um, we, we don't have as much uh, media access to, to those previous prophets, but certainly we can identify it. I would say um, President uh, Joseph Fielding Smith was kind of the, the doomsday prophet, maybe really into um, the second coming and, and things happening. So, so we kind of look, look at things that way. Um, so I would, here's, here's how I categorize. I would say President Benson, particularly, is, is the Jeremiah of the Old Testament. And he's, and President Benson is the prophet that has, that has warned, that warned us of today. And the time periods are about identical. Uh, it's about a 40 year process. Now, actually, Jeremiah lived through it because he lived so long and, 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 you know, so it's not exact, but it's very similar um, of how these prophecies are told and the warnings are there, but the outcome doesn't happen for years down the road. And I think what we're dealing with today in both the proclamation of the family as a continuation of that, uh, a, a proclamation to the world, the family, uh, I think the, the prophecies of and the warnings of President Benson are really, really for our day, our day. Now, the one world government, he talked about the UN, President Benson did, and he slammed the UN and its communistic or origins. And, and uh, it, 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 I think if you want to know what's going on today, we, we should look at those words. Now, um, that's, just my, that's just my opinion on that. So, okay, now I haven't talked about the jab or the, um, the mask mandates so for, for quite a while. Uh, I've hinted towards them a little bit here and there. Um, I still feel, uh, oh, if, 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 these offend, if this offends you, then you can uh, just shut this off right now. Um, you know, don't listen to it because it might trigger, trigger something. 
Uh, I think this is still a huge divide in the church. Um, it's interesting, the simple math to this is the more people that are jabbed, the more the COVID cases go up. So under, uh, since, well, let, we basically had COVID a year before the vaccine, and then we've had COVID a year with the vaccine, roughly. And, and I know that not everybody qualified for it and all that kind of stuff, and I, I get that. But, but in the last year, there are more confirmed cases of this virus with more people vaccinated than the previous year with less. Now, you could just say, well, that's because, you know, it multiplies, it multiplies, it multiplies. Well, but if more people are being jabbed, then how does that work? So simply put, the more people are jabbed, the more cases that, that, that are being reported. Um, I think na nationally, uh, it's, it's getting close to 70%, 65%, something like that. Of, of people uh, that qualified have been uh, fully vaxxed, okay? That's, that's pretty fascinating to, to see that. Um, and yet, hospitalizations, cases, everything. Now, we're being told that most cases still are those of the un-jabbed. Un and it's, I, I, you know... They they say this, and, and and yet I think there's evidence, you know, that, that says otherwise. Um, and many of us, all of us know somebody who is suffering with COVID that has had, that has been fully jabbed. Now, here's another thing. The booster. Where does the booster fit in? Um, some feel like that's part of being fully, fully jabbed, and... Uh, others don't. Um, I know. I know that the church isn't pushing the booster among missionaries like they did the jab, which is interesting. Um, it's still available, and but it's not being you know hammered. Now, this one is it's a homework assignment. <laughs> Uh, this one's interesting. Um, I've heard from some interesting and good sources that Rit Richard Harward, Harward, I think is how you say his name, he was the center for BYU this year. And there was a Deseret News, uh, or no, KSL article on him. Um, he's he's uh, not on the team anymore because of a heart condition. Now, a little background on him that I heard, and, and I trust this source, is that he resisted getting the, the jab. He was told by the athletic department at BYU that if he didn't get it, he'd be sitting on the bench. So against his better judgment, he got it. And shortly after, he collapsed on the court. He has this heart condition. Now, nobody will say that the two correlate together, and they buried this thing, but I have from a good source that, that this is exactly how they feel, the family, and that he might be um, taking legal action. Uh, his, his life and career of basketball is probably over. It's definitely over for this year, and, it's and it could be over. Now, the only reason why I bring this up is because everyone could say, well, that's one, that's one, that's one. Well, let me tell you, if you do a little bit of research, you see among athletes this, this trend of, of collapsing heart conditions and all these things, and it's usually associated with, with the jab. Now, I'm not going to get into all the other stuff concerning the church and why and, and all that. I've covered that before, and, and, and the bottom line is, in my opinion, 
we can be strong, active members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, supporting and sustaining our prophet, the apostles, the first presidency, without getting that. Now, the mask is another interesting thing because it... Uh, and Israel 365 had an article where the the Israeli uh, health department finally, finally admitted that there's no evidence that masks are really effective in, in the spreading of the COVID virus or not spreading it. You know, the wearing of it would, you know what I mean? There's no evidence that they work, okay? That's an easier way to say it, that masks don't work. Um, there's just no evidence for it. And yet it's this, I've heard so many times, well, it makes people feel more comfortable or it makes people feel safer. Feel? Anyway, so this, this thing, whatever we want to call it, continues to divide. Sue brought up uh, a really interesting thing the other day. She said, you know, it used to be... Um, apostates or just antagonistic people against the church that, that were our, you know, kind of our nemesis and, and someone who, who would, um, you know, bring up, you know, anti things and, you know, try to, try to mix things up a little bit. And in all reality, that just doesn't, really exist much anymore. Uh, it's, it's kind of a non thing. The, the real, uh, um, criticism of individuals in the church comes from other members of the church. It's, it's an interesting dynamic that's taken place in just the last few years. We used to, you know, bind together and, you know, if it was, I don't want to get into names or anything, but, but the antis, you know, that, that maybe were once part of the church, sometimes they weren't. And they, you know, they write books and some of them were husband and wife and they would campaign and, and go through neighborhoods and do all the things saying bad things about the church and, and, and the, the leadership of the church, both in the past and in the present and all that kind of thing. Now it's within the church. And I think one of the great uh, 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 evidences of that is is this is this latest, um, you know, whether you're wearing a mask or you're not wearing a mask, uh, whether you're uh, jabbed or whether you're not, um, determines your loyalty, your activity, your um, uh, following. Uh, the, the prophet or not. And I think it's really uh, a, a good insight. And I, and I think it's prophetic. It's prophetic. Um, uh, woe unto them that say all is well in Zion. Is that second Nephi? Uh, we had a discussion with our son on this, one of our sons. Um, uh, um, the other day, and I, I can't remember exactly. It's, I think it's towards the end of Second Nephi. Um, um, you know, the flax and cord and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, and it's usually because of pride within the church. And when it, when it says others, yeah, here it is. So it's Second Nephi 28. So woe unto them that turn aside the just, the, the, I'm in uh, 28, 16, that turn aside the just for a thing of naught and revile against that which is good and say that it is of no worth. For the day shall come that the Lord God will speedily visit the inhabitants of the earth. And in that day that they are fully ripe in iniquity, they shall perish. Okay, I love this. But if, they, if the inhabitants of the earth shall repent of their wickedness and abominations, and I think abominations is a key, is a key thing. Uh, I think it has to do, in my opinion, with um, uh, sacred ordinances and covenants, as well as um, um, the destruction of children, innocence, the destruction of innocence. Um, 
of their wickedness and abomination, they shall not be destroyed, saith the Lord of hosts. But behold, the great and abominable church, the whore of all the earth, must tumble to the earth, and great must be the fall thereof. For the kingdom of the devil must shake, and they which belong to it must needs be stirred up unto repentance, or the devil will will grasp them with an everlasting with his everlasting chains, and they be stirred up to anger and perish. Now, this is where it gets really interesting and pertains to us, the church. I shouldn't point to me, but I'm a member of the church, so, so it does point to me in that sense. But listen to this, verse 20. For behold, at that day shall he rage in the hearts of the children of men and stir them up to anger against that which is good. And then here we go. So that's the church of the devil or the, 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 the whore of the earth, the abominable, the great and abominable church, okay? The abomin, abominable church. Verse 21, and others, so this is a different group, will he pacify and lull them away into carnal security that they will say, all is well in Zion, and that's key, all is well in Zion. Yea, Zion prospereth, all is well, and thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them away carefully down to H-E double hockey sticks or H-E double toothpicks, okay? So when Sue and I were on our mission, uh, Elder Rasband was visiting with us and he said that when he was a 70, uh, then he was an apostle, but when he was speaking to us, but when he was a 70, he was in a room listening to the words of uh, Neil A. Maxwell. And Neil A. Maxwell was talking about this scripture. And you know what? Now that I think about it, he may not have been a 70, I can't remember, but he was, he li he was listening to uh, a president, or excuse me, Elder Neil A. Maxwell, uh, Elder Rasband was. And Elder uh, Neil A. Maxwell said, when it says others, he said, those are members of the church. Members of the church, others. Um, and behold, others he flattereth away and telleth them there is no hell. Have we heard that before? Um, and he saith unto them, I am no devil, for there is none. And thus he whispereth in their ears until he grasps them with, an, with, with his awful change, chains, from whence there is no deliverance. So it's interesting. So we have two others, but the one others, and, and the word is Zion, because only members of the church would, would say all is well in Zion. Okay. And that is where we, we need to focus because uh, all is not well in Zion. It's not, and we should identify that. And if we're the cause of that, we should fix it because Zion is, is an accumulation of people and their hearts knit together, and they're not right now. And I'm not saying that I have any answers. I'm just saying we have to live by the Holy Ghost. We have to be true to what the Spirit is whispering to us and live by that and go by that. And then um, um, we've done what we were supposed to do. Like our prophet said, and, unless we have the constant, President Nelson said this, unless we have the constant influence of the Holy Ghost in our lives, we will not survive spiritually. And I, I think that's one of the most prophetic things said by him uh, concerning our day and our time. So let's look backwards to see what, how to deal with things today is a pattern that was in the Old Testament, and I believe it is today. Um, I could be totally wrong on this, folks. I really could. But it just seemed to be a match. Jeremiah, President Benson, warning of destruction of Jerusalem, many years beforehand, 
President Benson warning us of secret combinations and awful things and the effect it will have on the church as well as the world. And then also a proclamation to the world, the family, how interesting that was so many years ago. And then, and it, it didn't make sense to have that out at that time because we all, even the world basically agreed with that <clears throat> for the most part. But now we totally see it. It's like Babylon is attacking us. King Nebuchadnezzar is leading it right in the, to the city and we're going, uh-oh, should have listened to Jeremiah, should have listened to Lehi, and now they're here. And now we're reading these things from the past going, uh-oh, should have paid attention, they're here. Love y'all. Talk to you soon, bye.